have ignition. Two, one, zero. We have a liftoff. We have a liftoff, and it's lighting up the area. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the pad. I remember at a really young age, I was afraid of drowning in my own bedroom because the Philippines is one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world and we experience a lot of super typhoons. Afghans are still facing more and more restrictions every single day. I want to be a voice of protest against the silence of the world through my artworks. Young people, we are quite mad about not being heard. We feel like the government is not really listening to what we have to say. I'm Leona, I'm 30 years old. I studied medicine in Germany, then later on joined my first rotation on board of a Sea-Watch rescue ship as part of the medical team. No one deserves to die at sea. Most every Sudanese person I know has been glued to their phones and their TV or computer screen since fighting broke out. I'm 32 years old this year. If you're 10 years younger or so, the Sudan that you know is so far different from the Sudan that I knew as a baby and very far away from what our parents knew. I guess people are uh, interested in what I have to say because my mother was killed in the October 7th attacks. My mother is uh, Vivian Silver. This is possible, and you know that already. I don't think the reality of what's happened has set in for anybody who has any personal attachment to Gaza. Air pollution is such a thing in Colombia. You just cannot breathe. With a group of friends, we decided to create a giant pair of cotton lungs and put it in the middle of one of the busiest public transport stations in Bogota. We started making travel a vehicle for peace. And we did something that some thought was crazy in the beginning, putting an Israeli and a Palestinian tour guides together for 10 days on a tour where people get to hear from both perspectives. I think it behooves us not just as Jews, but as Americans to speak out on issues that we feel affect us personally. And when we see people dying, whether it be innocent Israelis or innocent Palestinians, it causes us grief. And viewing that grief and that pain as a shared point of understanding, I think does the most to actually further the conversation. In Ukraine, you have 2,000 schools more or less destroyed. Why are you not printing building? The school we printed in 40 hours. I can do something today. I don't have to wait until I graduate. I don't have to wait until I have a job. I don't have to wait until I'm an adult to be an activist. Anyone can go talk to their neighbors, to listen and to spread a little bit of light. Welcome to the stage, Sarah Gilbert, President and Chief Content Officer at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Goosebumps. That was amazing, wasn't it? Um, good evening and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for an inspiring evening with rising leaders who are sparking real change, making history and creating lasting global impact. And thank you to United, um, tonight's presenting sponsor for helping make this evening possible. Their support and yours um, enables the council to involve even more people in the essential work of shaping an open and promising world. So you may know the council through our events like this one, our survey work, uh, our Emerging Leaders Programme, 
um, and other important ways in which we influence global affairs. But we're here tonight um, to celebrate this, um, a new way that the Council is extending its reach through Blue Marble. Um, inspired by the iconic Blue Marble photo of Earth taken by the Apollo 17 crew, uh, Blue Marble is a project founded by the Council to help the next generation of change makers and global leaders shape a more inclusive, equitable and sustainable world. We believe that empowering and amplifying the voices of young people globally is key to catalyzing that change. And to help deliver on this promise, we have recruited a global network of 60 plus people making a difference in key areas such as climate, equity, conflict and crises, culture and innovation and technology to serve as Blue Marble's next generation change, change makers. A few of them are here tonight um, and you'll meet them in just a couple of minutes. Um, Blue Marble will introduce you to them along with the people, places and issues defining our world right now. I hope you saw that in the video and in ways that will cultivate curiosity and build confidence. We have as our North Star, the aim of building a welcoming and inclusive community of globally con conscious people um, who want to better understand the world around them so that they can actively participate in it. And we are so grateful to you, our donors, sponsors, members and supporters for making it possible for us to meet this pivotal moment that we're in to see change to be change in our communities and around our world. Thank you and have a lovely evening. Please welcome a brilliant change maker and our host for this evening, Christina Adana. Good evening, everyone, or good afternoon. I think it's still five. I am pleasured to be your host today. As you can tell from the accent, I am a Londoner. My name is Christina Adana, and I am one of the change makers on the Blue Marble. I want to start by doing a quick call and response to break the ice, to get the energy going and something that will be recurring throughout the evening. So I'm going to say change. You say big change. Change. Big change. That was not good enough. Come on, guys. We've got some amazing speakers here for you. I need more energy. Change. Big change. Amazing. Right. So our first speaker of the night, Herman Santillan Ugarte, is a social entrepreneur and cultural chocolatier working towards a more inclusive and just future through the recognition of importance of indigenous, and cu indigenous cultures. Please welcome to the stage, Herman Santillan Ugarte. I have the privilege to call home one of the most magical and mystical places on earth, the Mixtec region of Oaxaca, a region where we live our rituals, gastronomic and social traditions day to day. It is very common for me to use handcrafted when I go to the market to grab my veggies or to see how farmers keep using ancient techniques to protect their soils. Even if we have a wide variety of traditions, there is one that has a special place in my heart and in the heart of our region, our special connection to chocolate. One of the things that makes our region so special is that our indigenous communities were among the first cultures in the world to use chocolate as a symbol for social unions. Today, in the Mixtec region of Oaxaca, it is very common for our people to share a cup of hot chocolate during weddings, birthdays, or funerals. As a child, I had the delicious chance to grow up with this tasty tradition. Unfortunately, even if we have a wide variety of these traditions, with more than 800 years of practice, we are considered officially one of the poorest regions of Mexico. The lack of professional opportunities and the low educational rates convert us to the region that exports the largest number of workers, not only to big cities in Mexico, but also the United States. Added to that, our country is facing its most challenging times for food production due to both climate change, and the fact that the average age of a Mexican farmer is about 65 years old. Just to give you an idea about how this looks, 
even if we have the conditions to grow uh, cocoa, uh, we have to say that four out of five chocolates made in Mexico are produced with foreign cocoa. And this is very sad because we are considered the crowd of chocolate. Eight years ago, I decided to do something about this situation. With 150 US dollars and an empty room in my grandmother's house, I decided to create Oaxacanita Chocolate. It's an organization that has created a collaborative and a productive chain that involves the work of cocoa farmers, traditional women cooks, and local artisans. Together, we are helping to share with the world our traditions around chocolate. One of our most recent projects is the Little Cocoa Academy, the first intergenerational agriculture program. Through play, we teach the children of our communities about our Asian chocolate traditions and how they can grow their own cocoa. It's been so successful that we have inspired a German organization to start a similar model like the Little Cocoa Academy in a community in Kenya as well. I have the tremendous pleasure to let you know that Oaxacanita Chocolate has been internationally recognized several times. People like former President Obama, organizations like Meta, TED conferences, and the World Economic Forum consider us one of the most important social innovations of the world. All of that, thanks to the 150 US dollars, the support of my family, the deep uh, understanding of my traditions, and a high sense of perseverance, purpose, and good values. For me, it's an honor to work in my region because it has led me to understand my country and our indigenous cultures better. After many years of work, I have realized that most of the rural and indigenous communities of the world face similar problems, like bad quality of education and lack of access to, to marketplaces. And even more than that, the global leadership crisis is becoming more and more important as cities and villages around the world cannot even offer the simplest public services to their citizens such as roads, security, or healthcare. This means many of the residents cannot reach their true potential. Why is supporting rural and indigenous communities more important than ever? Because according to the World Bank data, while we, the indigenous peoples, represent the 6% of total population of the world, we protect the 80% of the natural resources of our planet. And yes, it is possible to create a better world from this, but it will not come from the developed world imposing solutions from the outside. It will come from building community-based solutions like Oaxacanita, solutions that put as main value the deep understanding of local cultures, respect of the territory, and embracement of their own identity. Complex problems demand nuanced solutions. If we just take the time to listen and learn about the indigenous cultures before proposing paths forward, we will even realize that the terms regenerative agriculture or circular economy are just indigenous traditions put into practice. So I invite you to listen, build bridges of collaboration, support local leaders and organizations to create powerful changes in their communities. More than that, I invite you to understand and embrace your past so we can create together a better version of our future. Thank you. Yeah. the importance to listen to our local communities. I forgot to mention backstage, I asked every speaker what their favorite leader was. Hermann's was Albert Einstein, and our next speaker's is Angela Davis. So, Dr. Mayada Adil is a young leader for the Sustainable, de sustainable Development Goals doctor and fashion designer, recognized by the Se Secretary General's Envoy for Youth on her profound work in achieving the Agenda 2030 and contributing creatively to amplify and advance youth voices. Please join me in welcoming Mayada Adil to the stage. Hello, everyone. When I was a child, I was the tornado in my household, spoiled by my father until the age of six. Uh, when I had a sh big chunk of my childhood uh, memories in Sudan, surrounded by cultural richness, but poverty and pain. So my family decided to immigrate 
to establish better living conditions for us in a new continent, in a land that once upon a time was reluctant to women's freedom. So I was covered from head to toe and the things changed drastically as I had to suddenly my body become a shame. It was my coping mechanism to this new environment to focus on my studies and sharpen my visual memories, intelligence and artistic skills, to be always the first in the class and, and everything, but made me more isolated in this environment. I'll get bullied a lot. I was never fed, belong, I never fed anywhere, I belong in anywhere. But raised on fear, fear of saying something wrong, fear of being outspoken, fear of breaking society's rule or just existing and loving life. I knew this child in me wanted deeply to change her surroundings, to rebel against her society that she lived in. She just wanted to breathe, to be heard and to be seen. How difficult is that? People couldn't see what she wanted. They only saw a chaos rebellion in her eyes, that she needed to be behaved, to be conducted, to be tamed, to their closed and superficial manners of untruthfulness that actually um, that doesn't contribute to a better humanity. I kept telling this little child of me that the bat battle of living and being ourselves in this world is almost impossible to win. You know, stereotypical, third uh, world standards, female, Afro-Arab, what are the chances that she can win this battle in this world? But she disregarded this toxic thought. She knew she's halfway there. She kept fighting and said, I'll let the needle speak. I'll let the needle speak to your fears of what I could become if you opened the doors to education, enlightenment and awareness. I'll let the needle stitch together the torn bride and steam and innocent that ripped away from me. I'll let the needle stitch my broken skin. The same surgical needle I used to stitch the bleeding head of yours in the emergency room. I'll let the needle speak. I'll let the needle piece together the fabric of our society that alienate me, you, from which we rightfully belong. I'll let the needle speak. I'll let the needle speak of a new identity that I sketched in my scramble book, an identity of elegance, identity of grace, and beauty that exudes confidence and bound. From now on, if you found me in this runway of life, it's because the determined needle of hope had stitched for me an attire that shred pain and oppression, and the Almighty has designed for me a smile that would last generation to come. So this needle took me around the continents, back to my motherland, Africa. So as many young people in my generation, I believe what's personal, it's political, and what's political is personal. My personal transformation from being a Sudanese medic medical doctor, a fashion slash artist, activist, to United Nations Young Leader for Sustainable Developing Goals. I have learned if I want to see the change, I have to become the change I'm talking about. My own existence become political. That made me devoted more to bri bridging gaps between different layers of our society, to engage us all in a dialogue around the globe, in decision-making processes, to increase the human contributions so each one of us can feel an agent of change. Yesterday, while, while taking the flight back, to, uh, come, coming to Chicago, I was asking myself, what is self-love means to me? How to keep my mental health in a check despite those difficult times in our humanity and dignity is contested and severely, uh, severely in every ba daily basis. I came to realization that my, my love routine is given love and taking care of myself first and the others and acts of services to humanity. To be true to myself, it is a, an act of love. And to be humbled every single day when my mother called me in the morning and from far, far away, to ask me, did you eat? Did you shower? 
Did you wash your clothes? I'm still the daughter of this brave woman. I'm so inspired by her. I want to live this earth remembered. I lived, I loved, I served my human race by standing against injustices everywhere in the world and resisted as I did to little Mayada. To me, this is an act of love and it's the purpose of my living. I'm a work of art and, pro and progress, so the others. Today, when I speak to little Mayada, knowing in fact I was able to free both of us as we moved mountains to give hope for women emancipation, I know she's proud how far I came from all those obstacles that have been surrounding my life with love and compassion to her and to the world. Thank you so much. That was incredible and such an important reminder to center love and compassion in our work. So up next, Tama Pillai is the co-founder and advocacy director of Undi 18, a youth movement that successfully advocated for the voting age in Malaysia to be lowered from 21 to 18. His favorite leader is Nelson Mandela. It was in a college town in Blacksburg, Virginia, in a student apartment watching the 2016 US presidential elections that an idea was sparked. Young people need to vote. This spark would ignite a movement across oceans in my home country of Malaysia, challenging status quo and redefining Malaysian democracy. My name is Tarma Pillay, co-founder of Undi 18 or Vote 18. I traveled all the way from Malaysia. That's a 30-hour journey for, for those who, who, who don't know, right? In 2016, as two fresh graduates from Blacksburg, Virginia and Kalamazoo, Michigan, my co-founder, Kira Yusri and I embarked on a mission to lower the voting age in Malaysia from 21 years old to 18 years old. At the time, Malaysia was one of only nine countries in the entire world with a voting age of 21 and above. The entire, the idea of empowering young voters was seen as radical. But for us, it was not a radical idea. It was logical. We argued that every adult should have the right to vote. We knew that this change would be difficult because it requires a two-third majority for a constitutional amendment. But we persisted, driven by our conviction that the youth had the right to shape our futures. We started in late 2016, sending letters to Malaysian student and youth leaders around the world calling for their support. When we launched a few months later, we had grown to a coalition of 16 supportive youth organizations. So we had the momentum, but we faced a Malaysian government who really hated change. The government of Najib Razak and Barisan National had been in power for almost 60 years since our independence. But we persisted. When we were denied official platforms, our campaign harnessed the power of digital media, and grassroots activism. And lucky for us, in 2018, the tides changed in our favor. Malaysia had our first democratic transition of power in our history. Najib Razak was defeated and Pakatan Harapan, or the Coalition of Hope, was voted into power. With the support of the new government, the Undi 18 constitutional amendment went to parliament, but it was not an easy journey. The deck was stacked against us. We needed to build public support, but crucially, that government did not have the numbers. We needed the opposition to be on board. We worked hard trying to talk to everyone. We desperately tried to tell the opposition and the public that this is not a partisan agenda. This is about youth. This is about democracy. This is about justice. And thanks to the work that we did in July 2019, three years, after we started our advocacy, we passed the bill, we succeeded. And this bill did not just succeed. It was the first bill, the first constitutional amendment in Malaysian history with unanimous votes. 100% of Malaysian parliamentarians voted in favor of enfranchising 
young Malaysians and giving us the right to vote. Jubilation happiness, the Undi 18 bill was to be implemented in 2021, enfranchising millions of new voters. But good times don't last forever, do they? In 2020, the tides changed again, this time against our favour. The coalition of hope was toppled and an ultra-conservative coalition took power undemocratically. This new government used the COVID-19 pandemic to declare a national emergency, shutting down parliament and implementing the longest lockdowns in the world. They then announced that the implementation of the Undi 18 bill will be postponed almost indefinitely. They were afraid of the youth, they were afraid of democracy, and they were afraid of accountability. So what do we do? We built another co youth coalition, but this time to go to the streets and fight for democracy itself. In March 2021, we rallied hundreds of youth to brave the emergency ordinance to fight for our right to vote. Rally after rally, we gained momentum and our numbers swelled into the thousands. We faced police intimidation. I myself was called for police questioning 11 times. I was arrested. They wanted to scare us, but they did not scare us at one bit. They just made us more determined to fight and more determined to win. Also in March 2021, we filed a lawsuit against the then Prime Minister, Mohidin Yassin. 23 Malaysian youth took personal risks to be plaintiffs against the government. And it's because of their bravery that in September 2021, the High Court of Malaysia declared that the delays announced by the government to be irrational and unreasonable and ordered the Malaysian government to implement the constitutional amendments by the end of the year. So our efforts paid off. The protests had built strong public support in favour of the cause and the government decided that they will not appeal the order by the High Court because of the fear of public backlash. By the end of the, end of the year, the bill was implemented and the result was revolutionary. Literally overnight, an unprecedented 5.8 million new voters were added into our electoral roll. For context, that's an increase of 40% of the total number of voters in Malaysia. This is a clear demonstration of the power of youth advocacy. All this, from a simple idea by two college kids. Our journey with Undi 18 is a story of giving voice to the voiceless, of turning a crazy idea into a remarkable reality. It is a story that shows that the power of perseverance and belief in a cause, if you're willing to take the risk to act. Thank you very much, everyone. fire and passion. Thank you so much, Thurma, for your brilliant words on how we enact change and turn a minority to a majority. So now we're moving on to my favourite bit, the panel section, um, where you guys actually get to vote and talk and ask questions. So please go to ccga.live and you can ask some questions, upvote other questions that you like, or you can don't know if there's a mic nearby, but we could ask live questions as well. So, Herman reminded us to listen before we act. Mayada told us to center love in everything we do. And Tama told us about the importance of strength and fire in our work. I'd like to invite them all back onto stage. And we're gonna start with a couple questions. So I wanted to start by oh my microphone's fallen off. I wanted to start by asking um, in just a sentence, what did you find most impactful about what someone else said? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, I for me, I think I, I think I loved uh, I love the the uh, I think both journeys uh, of fighting for for our cause, um, but I think very relevant for all stories. I think is the idea that the personal is political. Right, and we champion um, our, you know, through, through our personal identities, we draw strength from that. 
I think that was something that was particularly inspiring for me. Not there's more than one sentence, but uh, yeah, yeah <laughs> it's still on an adrenaline rush right now. Yeah. Well, for me, I think that it's very beautiful to see how people can think about others, and I think that that's very powerful to create changes in this world. To think about how we can create change for the others to make this world better a little bit. I totally agree with what all of what you said, adding to the fact that each one of you, they're so passionate in what they do, and it reflects and it inspired the others. It also inspired what you said, that you've been, you've been caught up in the prison and then you just kept pushing forward and you are the same thing. So I, I think we united in uh, having the passion for doing the things that we love for the others as well. Amazing. So I think there's something really interesting. Can you guys hear me at the back, by the way? Yeah? All good. Um, there's something really interesting about how you all spoke about your local cultures and communities in enacting change. Talk to me more about how culture can be really important, or maybe not so, in political enga engagement. Um, for me, I think culture is incredibly important uh, when it comes to um, fighting for change, because Culture represents um, two aspects. One is the resistance that you will face towards change. And the second is the opportunities that you have to make change happen. And as change makers, I think these things are very, very important. And sometimes um, a lot of change makers, what, what I notice is that we often take ideas or visions of what we want to, what we want to create into the world. And we think this is a great thing. This is something that needs to happen. And we want this to happen. But often we do not consider the, the cultural element and the background that we are in um, to consider what are some challenges that we may have to overcome. At the same time, what are certain things that we might be able to leverage? And I think that's something that's so important um, in terms of becoming an effective activist. Um, so I think that the ability to understand culture, to embrace it, to uh, navigate it is such an important tool. Yeah, and I want to add, like, when, when you understand the local context that you live, for example, me, that I come from a rural community, uh, nowadays we see or we saw business as an organization that has to grow fast, no? What, what do we hear a, a lot uh, about fail fast and do things fast? But we also have to understand that there's a lot of context around the world and in the rurality, things are happening much more slower. And that is one of the things that I should um, be aware of to, to, to change and to spread with our people. Because changes are not fast. Complex problems, they really demand very critical uh, solutions that must understand not only one, um, one, one um, characteristic of the problem, but we have to understand a whole system and I think that today's problems are not well solved because current leaders are not well aware about how the complexity of the world is uh, nowadays. For sure. I'm, I'm super interested in what you have to say, Mayada, just specifically would, because you're a fashion designer. Exactly. I think my answer was related to fashion. To answer this question, I, the current uh, situation in Sudan, the culture is not very, um, it's only activate the resistance, but if I go back to the history and look back to how women uh, dealt with their bodies and how they've been uh, carrying themselves, like in the 60s after the, the British colonization left Sudan, women did not have a, an equal opportunities of education like men. So the, the only way that they were showing their resistance through their fashion. So they were wearing a very traditional Sudanese taupe. Uh, to, to cover, but not, not in an Islamic way, but it's just to cover their, their clothes to say, we are here and we're going to resist the way that we want, even if we don't have education. So also, if you look back to the history, it also gives us uh, lessons to learn from and to sharpen our tools to, to resist better the, 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 the current situation and even the future. And what did you guys think your turning point was in activism where people in power, whether they be policymakers, influencers, when did they start listening to you? Well, I, I think that for, for myself, uh, we had two break points. Um, one was when we gave our first TED talk that was presented in Monterey, in California. 
It has reached about 2 million views. It has been translated into 19 different languages. And because of that, we have become a much more stronger voice around um, social change. And the other moment that we have lived, um, we participated in the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles. So I had the chance to share our model of Oaxacanita Chocolate with prime ministers, with government officials. And we were discussing about the importance of creating business models that are cultural related. So we are not experiencing these colonization uh, processes that our towns have lived for so many years. So we are very happy because, you know, like th these kind of changes, as I said, they take time, but it, it is so good to be seated right now here, like uh, sharing our stories with you, because that is also a turning point for all of us and for the world. We are giving that message that right now the, the, the world is really prepared to listen to new voices. And that makes me very, very proud. What does it take to be a change maker? I think it takes courage. I think that's, that's the most important thing. Often we, too many people want good things in the world, but you're often not able to take the first step. And I think that's something that you really have to be brave enough to just try it out, right? Um, and often in life uh, and in many situations, the, I think the most painful thing you know, that, that you look back on is that regret that you could have done something, you would have done something, you were in the right position, but you didn't do it, right? Um, so I think that's, that's something that, that, is, uh, is, um, that, that you need as a change maker. For me, one of the scariest moments that I shared just now, um, police intimidation and, uh, and all that was that they, you know, they even went to you know, your, your, your family's house, right? Just to, and uh, it, wasn't, it was just a, a process of trying to intimidate you. Right, um, go, you know, go go and find your your parents. Go and go all the way to uh, some of my friends. They went all the way to their villages just to deliver, saying that hey, your your child or your cousin is going to be called to the police station. Right, it's a it's a sense of trying to scare you into submission. So there is a need to say to power and to speak to it and say that I'm not afraid of you, right? And I will choose to be fearless. And there is nothing that you can do to me that I am not afraid of. Uh, of uh, you know of uh, of accepting and uh, and I think that fearlessness makes those in authority you know afraid of you. I think I'll put it like in a punchline for Twitter. Uh, first, <laughs> uh, to to be vocal and to follow your inner uh, voice and to know your power and strength and what we can do to the world. So I'm hearing a lot of courage and strength. And as a change maker myself, I find that quite exhausting. I do a lot of campaigning in malnutrition and hunger, um, which is obviously a very harsh reality, but a very depressing topic to work in. So how do you find joy both within and outside of your work? And, and, and what does that look like on a day to day? Yeah, I, I just want also to have want to change. Well, I want to respond to that question because uh, one of the things that we have built during all these years of work, this, this next May, we are going to be uh, nine years working in, in the region. And as I told you, right, like if you are working in a community uh, with, with all the conditions that you have, you have to understand that things are slow. So what's next? So we have discovered joy in our day to day, you know? Like when we help one of our traditional cooks to support their families, when some of their kids get graduated from kindergarten or primary school, we celebrate that. And I think that nowadays we have to find joy in our day to day because uh, we have been living in this world that tells us to pursue our dreams and to achieve goals. And everybody is uh, uh, like, like not uh, listening to the process. So I think that one of the principal and main conditions that one change maker needs to have in today's world is to learn to really have and find joy in your day-to-day -day activities. I was literally going to say the same. <laughs> I yeah. find joy in small things rather than big things. And um, I enjoy the small moments that I spend uh, with my family, with my friends, uh, and 
exchanging energies with people that you love, it's, it's bring, it brings joy always. I mean, and I noticed something. I um, am a very um, introverted person and I, I love people. I'm bubbly. My sister always tell me you're a bubbly person. So I take also the joy from sharing uh, common interests with other people. So this is also a joy. I just want to add something. I, I, I think I love love what they've shared. I totally agree. Very important. Um, very, I think one, one thing I would love, love to also say is that to appreciate what you've done. I think that's something that's very important, right? Um, yeah. You know, to, to take a moment to stop and think and appreciate that, hey, I've actually done pretty good stuff, right? You know, I, yes, I, I, I may not change the entire world, right? I may not change everything, but I made something happen, right? And be yeah. proud of yourself. Yeah. Um, I think it's that sense of appreciation because, uh, you know, many times um, activism, you know, change making is a lonely journey, right? Your friends, your family, uh, even sometimes your closest, your loved ones may not understand the journey that you're on, the challenges that you face, right? But can you at least take that moment to tell to yourself, hey, I'm, I'm on the right path. You know, I'm, I'm doing something that has meaning. I enjoy it. I love it. And I appreciate what I've done. I think that moments of just taking a step back, telling that, you know, that self-affirmation is so important if you want to do this for the long time, the, the, the long run. Because trust me, if you don't do that, you will get burnt out because you realize that, you know, if you're just chasing and you're saying that, oh my goodness, it's climate change, it's democracy, it's, oh, it's the, the world, you know, it's such big things. And then you get lost in it all, right? And you, and you just, just get lost in the idea that, am I enough? Am I making any change happen? because you're looking in that mega context. But real, the reality is that you are just a human. We're just, you know, small, small fragments in this, you know, this grand scheme of life. So appreciate that you made things happen. Yeah, so the importance of sustainable activism, yeah. Yeah. for yeah. sure. I, th I think what's super interesting about the mix of people that we have is that you've been going at it for ages. And even when you weren't going at it, you were having the thoughts, you were having the the passion, the motivation, and eventually you found the courage to to go down your paths. So because of the fire you have inside of you, you have to take care of yourselves and, and find joy in the everyday. I think that's beautiful. I wanted to ask um, to everyone, but Thama specifically, uh, about 2024 as an election year. 49% of the global population are going to be in nations that are holding elections. What are your thoughts? Are you afraid? Are you are you hopeful? Um, I, I have to be very 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 honest uh, because I mean I look at politics on a daily basis, um, and um, we are on a very worrying trend, right? I mean this 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 is the reality, right? Um, the the idea of how social media was meant to unite us all, and instead we are now left into this fragments of extreme ideology. You know, if you're slightly conservative, you know, then now you're just pushed towards, you know, an entire different realm altogether. And so many people are being radicalized with uh, extreme ideas that um, it's becoming very, you know, I think very dangerous for societies. The polarization creates hate, animosity, and eventually it creates violence, right? Mm -hmm. So I do think that is something that is very worrying as a worldwide trend. Not, I mean, not just in the US, not just in Malaysia, but in many parts of the world, you see something similar. So I do think that's something that, uh, that we need to be able to address, uh, to navigate that. And uh, of course, there's, there's many, many ways that we can go about it. Uh, so that's one thing. But on a more hopeful front, I do think that more people have the ability because of how open information is to have better conversations about what they want and how they want to achieve what they want. I think that's something that's very hopeful. So when I go and uh, when I do programs with, uh, with low-income youth, uh, minority youth, what I realize is that compared to their parents or their grandparents, even, even though they are economically disadvantaged, but their idea-wise, their mentality, their philosophy is rich. Their ability and desire for change is there. And I think that's something that is quite empowering and that has a reflection in many uh, elections worldwide. So um, there is some bad, but also there's some elements of good. Erwan? Well, there's a lot to say. You know, in Mexico, we are having too many struggles, as you have probably listened in the news. Uh, it's just a fact that we are living over most um, uh, 
uh, worrying times, not only in Mexico, but also in all the world, you know, like the, the global leadership crisis is becoming very, very hard. And even if we can talk about all the problems that we have in the world, I think that one of the biggest solutions that we can do right now as, as change makers is to think about the future of our planet, the future generations. One of the things that we have discovered in, in Oaxacanita Chocolate with the Little Coco Academy course is that uh, most of the kids don't want to keep living in their communities, not because they don't find a job or not because they don't have opportunities. It's because the elders of the communities doesn't allow them to take responsibilities in their lands. So it is very sad to see how youth cannot um, say something about how we are going to manage our natural resources, how we can do things for the community because the old people <laughs> doesn't let them to do that. So one of the things that we are currently working in is trying to lead by the example and try to um, push really good values. I know that this probably sounds tricky, right? But I think that nowadays we are living in the opposite world, right? Where the, the, the one that cheats is the one that wins. The one that uh, learns and study more is the one that receives a lot of bullying. So we need to change that trend, right? We have to support the people that it's doing the right things. And that, I think, is the only way we are going to create a better world. And I think that if we boost and if we support in, and if we, you know, like here in the United States, when there's a new entrepreneur, they support them and they do that. And in Mexico, for example, there are some communities that when you start a business, the people is like being jealous about you, right? So we have to build this new vision of collaboration. And that's going to be very important for us to lead that. But yes, it's going to take a, a time. Agree. I'm going to push back, though, on my original question. I want to talk about this year and what we're facing imminently, because envisioning a better future is all well and good until all our ideas of the future are very different, right? Are we working towards the same thing? I think in the States in 2016, loads of people were shocked because they were like, oh, I didn't realize that so many of these so many people thought differently to me so what does this election year have to offer to the world how do you think people do you think young people are going to turn out to vote if they do where do you are you confident in your own governments i want honesty <laughs> and I, I i want you to be very real because change making is really hard and and a lot of your you know, a lot of the, the trials and tribulations you face are from your own governments. Mm. Um, I, I'll take this very quickly, but I would love to hear your perspectives. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, speaking from my, uh, my personal experience with elections, uh, we actually had the highest youth voter turnout rate, um, you know, in history uh, after the implementation of the UNDI 18 bill. Um, so we were, the, the youth or the young voters were the second highest cohort. Uh, the first was between the, the, the age group of 50 to 55, 82% uh, came out, the youth was 81%, right? Um, so, you know, so it was very close, like, so young people came out in force. So if you ask the question of why, it's because they felt empowered. They felt, you know, young people had the numbers, they had, they had the motivation to, to speak up the, and the feeling that, you know, politicians need to listen to us, right? Um, so I think that was the, the context and that was one of the reasons why we wanted to push for these kind of reforms, right? Um, so for me is, I... I, am, I, I do believe in the power of ideas and motivation, but more than that, I also believe in the power of certain systemic reforms that you need to implement in your country in order to have real empowerment, right? Not just philosophical empowerment, but real ones, right? And that's the reason why we, you know, we fight for uh, laws against gerrymandering, against malapportionment, for empowering through vote, uh, vo voting age. I think that's what we, what we are fighting for, right? Um, and the result is, is an empowered youth fighting for their economic and also um, generational empowerment. Yeah. I really would like to share my opinion, but I, I feel like I'm already left out of this conversation. Being a Sudanese, we never had an election and, and we never, in my, in my time, we had a dictatorship. Moving to Saudi, you know the situation. In Paris, I'm a political refugee, so there's no place for me to make that. But I will urge the American voters, which is you, the, the audience, 
to think of people like us, to, to think of people that left out of those uh, political spheres, uh, because we know America is inf uh, influencing the foreign affairs and the foreign um, state of the world. Um, think of uh, uh, a leader that actually can call for a ceasefire um, in Sudan, in Congo, in the Gaza, in, in Ukraine. Think of, uh, of others at the foreign um, affair of the world um, and that serve the best interest of the American people. That's, that's like all I can say. Yeah, well, and, and, and personally, I think that, well, more than ever here in Mexico, well, in, in, in my country, we are facing a very uh, worrying time where the narco is uh, having so much impact in all the, the country, you know. Uh, and this is very important because if we don't have good leaders that can handle this situation, the problems are just uh, going into the ground. That's one of the things that we were talking, you know, like there's like a lot of global uh, conversations and papers and how we are going to create a better world, but how you can make those papers can set uh, in the ground, can have impact in the ground. So right now, I really believe that Mexico is having uh, too many struggles with that. Um, the call, the, the, you know, like the, the glorification of, of narco is becoming uh, evident in our country. It's very common to see in Oaxaca, like in, in my state, little kids that at the age of seven years, they want to become a narco. They don't want to become a, a fireman or an astronaut. It, and it's very sad. So we have to lead by the example. And I think that we should vote. We should uh, firstly participate in the democratics, but that is not enough. We have to understand our laws, as citizens, we have to participate actively in our community because this is the world is not going to change by a vote, right? Yeah. So it's more than that. It's very complex. Thank you so much for your contributions. We're going to move on to questions. So please go ahead and line up around the mic. I'm going to start reading out some of the questions we've seen on CCGA Live. Please enter some more if you'd like. So quick fire round because we're kind of short on time. All of you started as an individual. Can you talk more about the details of mobilizing your communities and resources, especially the inertia of starting locally and gaining momentum into such global movements? So it's a kind of like, <laughs> just put that in like a two sentence answer. <laughs> I think it's, very, it's a matter of perseverance. I will say that if you want to motivate change, you have to give results uh, and be perseverant. Focus in your work, uh, give results to your community, to your team, and then all the awards and all the recognition will come as a consequence. I think I would just say make it more attractive and appealing for others to join the movement um, and, and not using like complex phrases like uh, I know people a lot saying the sustainable development goals is it's uh, it's complex, but it's just really not. We do it on a daily basis um, by helping others and around like symbolize the 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 words, symbolize the the action, so everyone can join the movement. Yeah, cool. Hello, darling. Hi, um, my name is Rory. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm a recent college graduate. I went to school in D.C. and Obviously, everything that each of you are doing is incredibly important, and I think that in the United States and globally, access to higher education is incredibly diff difficult, and it's very expensive for people to access. So I wanted to ask each of you, how important would you say your education was in providing you with the resources, the skills, and the drive to pursue your passions and um, fighting social injustice. I can share. Um, so I, I came from a, from a low-income uh, community, from a family. Um, I really was able to achieve where I am today uh, only because, uh, I mean, in, 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 my, in my country, we have significant government support for education. Uh, even when, when I, I shared that I studied in the US, I actually studied on a government scholarship, a uh, Malaysian government scholarship uh, to come here, actually. Otherwise, I would never have been able to afford it. Um, so, so we have a system of uh, giving it to bright students who, who do well academically and all that stuff, right? But for me, it's, it's, it's incredibly important, right? Uh, you know, when you are, I think there's a bit of a cultural improvement 
um, as a as an individual. Well, you know, some of the ideas that you have and you contain when you are, I think, low income or you are from a different background. But compared to that, when you when you experience the world, you meet different people, even from a college campus. It's in, incredibly empowering, and uh, it changes the way you see the world and the opportunities that you are able to. Um, to to take advantage of. So I, I do think that higher education is incredibly important and it's so important to invest in it, whether you're a government, whether you're a parent, whether you're an individual. And um, yeah, I mean, for me, I think governments have to invest in in, uh, in education, right? So I think that's, that's for me. Well, personally, I, I believe education, it was my survival. The only way that I could survive the difficult um, uh, situation from poverty to the... Uh, restriction of the conservative environment or the Islamic conservative uh, environment that I lived in. Um, education it was my friend. It was the, the way that I, I, I understood the world and, and made me more curious to understand uh, better the world and travel to understand the, the, the people and be more accepting of the others. Um, yeah, it's the only way. To me, it was the only way. Yeah, and, and I just want to add also that coming from countries outside the United States, another challenge that we have is about the language. <laughs> so, sure. for example, coming me coming from Oaxaca, it's obviously that if I didn't learn English, I haven't the opportunity to be here, right? So we have like the other challenge. And I am very surprised and I just want to, to thank publicly because, for example, right now that we are giving this conversation, Uh, and that has been very difficult for me to have contact with our uh, Mexican government. Right now, uh, the General Consul of Mexico is right here. So I just want to thank her for your presence, Reina. Uh, and, and I am very happy because, you know, these are kind of the results that we are showcasing, right? How we can uh, go away from the borders and try to say to our people that we are in some way impacting our community and that is like a consequence but yeah i i mean education is a pillar of change and you have to take the advantage whenever or it doesn't matter the institution i i really believe that the student makes the institution so if you have any opportunity you have to take the best of it and yeah the results will talk by its own amazing so I'm gonna try, we've literally got like three minutes. So I'm gonna ask a couple questions. Give me like one word, couple word max. Okay. Um, effective ways for outsiders to get involved and support movements. Whatever comes to your mind first, just say it. Um, donate, go to protest together and uh, pay attention. Yeah. Cool. Buy products with uh, purpose. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Future or present, which one do you like to think in? Present. It makes future. Present. I like the future because I like to work backwards. Beautiful future, beautiful present. <laughs> I think both <laughs> are important. <laughs> <laughs> How, oh, that one's actually a hard one. Okay, oh, where do you go? Uh, yeah, oh, okay. sorry, I was... <laughs> yeah, 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 get like 20 seconds max. <laughs> so, Raj Fernando, I'm on the board of the Chicago Council. Wonderful presentation, wonderful, inspiring stories. So, uh, in 2016, so talking about the election in 24, in 2016, it was obviously very close. Uh, I'm a, the Chicago Council is nonpartisan. I per personally am a Democrat. 2016, Hillary won the popular vote by a little bit over 3 million votes, uh, lost on three states by under 60,000 votes in 2020. Biden won the popular vote by over 7 million and just won by like 50,000 or so in three states. Of all, all four of your countries, just where would, and this is an exact science here, obviously, where would you speculate your country is with regards to who they were be voting for? I kind of have a good idea, but just kind of want to cool. hear your thoughts. Before yeah. you guys answer, we'll take the next question and then you guys can... Uh, hi, my name's Henry. I'm a current student at Northwestern. And I think you all come from countries where there is a clear political divide. And we're looking at the 2016 election, you know, a great portion of our country didn't recognize kind of the concerns, the desires of another portion of our country. Now it seems we have not only a social divide, but a major political divide between two groups in our country. Like, what do you see, the, based on your own experiences from your own country, what do you see as the path forward for America? Cool. 
Last lines, they were heavy as hell. Oh yeah, my god! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> as fast uh, as you can. <laughs> sorry, the first question was where where would our countries lie on the yeah, spectrum? Yeah. Uh, my country is insanely conservative, so we'd be on whichever very conservative end of the spectrum. Uh, I don't think I'm I'm like super liberal, but relative to my to my country, I'm like the the crazy end of progressive, right? Um, so just, just for context, right? Uh, so that's one. Second one was in terms of a path forward. Uh, for me, is uh, to to have a have a national vision and have and and have that vision and it's tough it's theoretical but someone needs to sell that idea and that's how you build people together yeah cool. well i mean uh, we're, con we're my country r right now is in war so i don't know i can <laughs> add much to the the question um, yeah thank you oh, well I, I personally think that our country is right now um, uh, having a, 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 an evolving because you know like mexico it's a very surreal country where in, in, in one state you can watch big parties and cultural stuff and in the other you see another expression. So our country is that big that I think that nowadays with technology uh, we are understanding each other and we are also understanding that we are different and that Mexico is a very big country. And yeah, you know, nowadays that we have this uh, risk about AI and how uh, information or misinformation is going through social media, um, I, I think that one of the things that we are living right now is that as the Mexican traditional family is composed by everyone, you know, like there's the, the grandfather living with the grandsons, uh, I have seen that in most of the local families, there is like these conversations about how you can use better your phone, how you can use better social media. So I think that uh, that is one of the things that is saving our country, right? If the family is saving our country to become much more um, aware about what the others think. Wow. Thank you so much for such an important and impactful conversation. I think so. Oh, oh my God. It's a triple zero right now. <laughs> Leave a thought. How about that? <laughs> oh, never mind. Uh, oh. <laughs> Go on, just do it. Yeah. Hey, to follow up with the last question, uh, me, myself, being a Bosnian refugee, um, the war refugee as well, uh, I do understand that uh, politics was at one time in the beginning of history a considered an art form, whereas a uh, many countries outside the United States have something called policies where like a public square people would meet and talk about, you know, the problems, communal and et cetera. And with another layer on top of that, as we have emerging technologies and social media and things like that, that separate populations. Uh, and even so more so in America compared to, you know, the rest of the world where we don't have communal spaces, public spaces where we could just interact, talk about our issues. Everything happens through, you know, Twitter, online or social media, which leads to the polarization. How would you expect um, in a country such as this for like, are you to deal with that or bypass that wall that's, you know, just restricting us? I'm Simply have okay. difficult conversation. Learn to have difficult conversations. Not everyone is going to be thinking in the same way as you, but you have to be mature enough to understand and to try to understand the other's point of view. And if you don't think the same, it doesn't mean that you have to be an enemy. Uh, it, it means that you have the possibility to understand better the world. Simply have intergenerational dialogue. I think all the generations should be fit and talk about the issues that concern the different generations. Uh, very quickly, I, I think education is very important here uh, because through education, you get the skills to navigate the rest of your life, including these difficult conversations. Um, so for me, if, I, I don't think this public town square exists in most countries anymore because all a social media mess, right? But fundamentally is that we are not preparing our kids and next generation to have these conversations mm. and go out in the world. And that's what we should be changing. Okay. Well, <laughs> final thank you, guys. <laughs> Change! <laughs> they forgot it. Change. Come on, energy. Oh my God, change. change. There we go. All right. So now we'll wel welcome to the stage Christina Colon, Director of Audience Strategy and Impact at Blue Marble.